My name is uh, Dr. Anya Kanubia. I am a lecturer in history uh, and in law at the University of Edgehill, the University of Huddersfield, and I also teach at the University of Nottingham. I've been asked to comment on the triumph of art, this fantastic painting by Nicolas Pierre Loire. Uh, Loire was a uh, French painter. Uh, who lived between the years 1624 to 1679 and I've been asked to comment on him. Uh, I would love to be there in person with you but unfortunately um, because of circumstances regarding the pandemic uh, and where we find ourselves um, that's unfortunately not possible. I do have a presentation um, with slides and uh, during the course of the lecture uh, I will be referring to images from those slides. Those images should appear in the right hand side of this um, lecture. Um, if they don't, and it's rather unfortunate, I should be forwarding it uh, to um, uh, colleagues at the museum um, so they should find a way of inserting it even if they do not appear naturally um, in this lecture. So um, I thought it was uh, uh, useful for us to uh, begin with looking at the um, ideas uh, behind this fantastic painting, this Renaissance painting, uh, sometimes called or often called the Triumph of Art. Um, this painting uh, by Nicolas uh, Pierre Loire uh, is a Renaissance painting. Uh, the Renaissance is the name given to the period of history during the latter part of the 17th century uh, and into the beginning of the early 18th century um, and including often parts of the 16th century when Europeans look back into the past to make sense of their reality in the present and shaped and formed the characters and the people of the past so that they mapped uh, images and representations um, uh, to glorify individuals that are living. These sort of Renaissance images are often allegorical and this painting is no exception. If we look carefully at it, I hope that you can see it, it includes a number of real sort of real looking people, people drawn almost from life and it also includes some rather imaginary characters. Notice that there are cherubs. Um, these are winged uh, people. Uh, if you look carefully at the images uh, below, just underneath the word Baptiste, you can see a cherub, um, a baby it seems with wings, uh, who are of course fictitious fictitious um, uh, creatures. Uh, babies don't have wings. Uh, next to the mirror, the mirror that contains an image of Jean uh, Baptiste Colbert, there are also cherubs and I believe some angels which are carrying this mirrored image. And of course in the center is a representation of Apollo, Apollo the, the sun god. Um, this character is a metaphorical representation of King Louis the Fourteenth. King Louis the Fourteenth was the ruler of France and he was Colbert's master uh, and the master of all France. And the Apollo uh, drawn here, painted here, is an allegorical representation, a metaphorical representation of Louis the Fourteenth. And Colbert is shown in as a sort of mirror reflection of something uh, that is being drawn to uh, the Apollo with his outstretched hand. Now this image is of course allegorical but it's nevertheless political um, and strategically so. Loire was a French painter and engraver uh, and he used to paint religious and historical images he traveled to Italy in uh, the 1640s where he studied the work um, of, a, of a, a fellow French artist called Nicolas Poussin and uh, he, whilst um, he was uh, undergoing these uh, travels he also painted this 
very interesting painting called the Allegory of the Foundation of the Academy Royale. Now the image of, in this painting is very similar to the one that we've just seen but conversely slightly differently to that one uh, it is believed that the image there is in fact the image of Louis XIV himself not uh, Jean Baptiste Colbert so uh, in a way going back to the previous image uh, he has sort of supplanted himself he has supplanted uh, John Baptiste Colbert in the same place that Louis XIV once held signifying that this Jean Baptiste Colbert has immense power <coughs> in French society and that he wants to show that he has that representation almost divine representation but look how Louis XIV has now become a divine personage a divine representation a god and Jean Baptiste uh, Colbert has become uh, almost a reflection of that divine representation so Loire uh, the French artist <coughs> who painted the um, the two paintings uh, we've just been referring to was a pupil of uh, Sebastian uh, Bourdain and Simon Vouet yeah, he later um, became a follower as I said of Nicolas Poussin and it is sometimes wrongly attributed that those two paintings or at least the first um, was actually painted by him when in fact it was Loire that painted them now Loire also traveled to Italy uh, throughout the years of 1647 to 1649 so his paintings um, reflect some of that style and we must remember of course that during this time Italy wasn't one country but a series of independent countries but there was nevertheless a style that we associate with the artists uh, that come from there and we can see that style represented in his work it's a similar style um, as we have in Michelangelo's work or Leonardo da Vinci's work or, or other um, artists that are coming from that peninsula uh, from that region that we now call Italy uh, uh, Loire was also a pupil of Francis uh, Detroit um, uh, the latter married his sister-in-law um, and uh, he was um, one of the notable French artists of his time um, and a well-known luminary. Now Jean-Baptiste uh, uh, Colbert uh, who is in the mirror image is a very interesting and striking person. His official position was intendant of finances that's a position that he obtained on the 4th of May 1661 he served diligently um, Louis XIV uh, that same Louis XIV portrayed as a divine personage that same Louis XIV who encouraged his subjects to regard him as a living God a divine being now Jean Baptiste uh, Colbert uh, was his chief minister his chief um, um, uh, operator and took up a position in France very very similar although of course with a different title uh, to the previously um, hugely important uh, and megalomania uh, megalomaniac um, Cardinal Richelieu uh, Cardinal Richelieu of course was the infamous prelate who through guile and cunning um, managed to get himself into a position of immense power and authority in France in fact uh, many have, have suggested that in his lifetime he intended to become Pope he never succeeded at that but he certainly was one of the most important people not only in France but also in Western Europe now Jean Baptiste Colbert followed in his footsteps and took on the reins of authority that Cardinal Richelieu um, and his descendants um, l actually had in France now if we know about the uh, machinations cunning and guile of Richelieu then we can figure out how Colbert had a similar kind of guile and cunning if we can remember um, how for example Richelieu is portrayed in those stories um, by the famous French 
author Alexander Dumas, The Three Musketeers, etc., where Richelieu is portrayed as a scheming, crafty, cunning, deceptive man who uses religion and politics to maneuver himself into a position of absolute authority. We can also see that Colbert uh, would be a similar individual who used similar mechanisms, uh, the Machiavellian method, the Machiavellian method, in order to achieve positions of prominence and status uh, within France. He, Colbert centralized authority and power uh, within France under his control and for the king. He increased the state power and diminished local power and created a more unified state with a unified um, system of treasury, a unified system of organization uh, for the purpose of increasing the automatic and authoritarian power of the king and ultimately of course then himself as the administrator for the king. So a key aspect of Colbert's uh, philosophy was the promotion of mercantilism. Mercantilism is the system um, which predated industrial capitalism where merchant adventurers took on prominent positions to advance trade whilst also operating protectionism at home. These adventurers often had unscrupulous activities in the promotion of that trade which included the usurpation of colonial territories held by other sovereign states and the amassing of wealth from those colonial states and the bringing home of that wealth without let hindrance or recourse to the previous colonial master. Of course the people who were there before either colonial power were considered as collateral in this process. So Colbert increased the mercantilism of France. He really helped France become a world power. Whereas before uh, the chief powers in Europe had been Spain, had been Portugal, had been the Holy Roman Empire uh, and to a perhaps lesser extent the Venetian state as a trading state. What Colbert did was make sure that France became, if not the third power in Europe, behind Spain and Portugal, certainly at least the fourth power in Europe. Now, Colbert's uh, philosophy was to uh, promote trade and for the French to become traders and merchants and to seize colonial territories and to hold colonial territories and to manage colonial territories with a kind of ruthlessness. Now before um, Colbert there had been of course French colonialism and imperialism but what Colbert attempted to do was to turn that imperialism into a profitable economic entity and with the profits that came from those colonial benefits he be embarked on a process of building. Uh, these, uh, this building um, made him extraordinarily popular as a member of government and extraordinarily popular with the king, with the emperor, um, with, with King Louis. And he built the, uh, almost from scratch, the Academy of Inscriptions and Medals in 1663. In 1666 the Academy of Sciences, uh, which is now part of the Institute of France and the French Academy. 1667 the Paris Observatory uh, which employed Claude Perel uh, and uh, Abel Giovanni um, Cassini um, from uh, what is now Italy uh, to superintend uh, these activities and in 1669 uh, he um, uh, built the Academy de Opera later renamed the Academy Royal de Musique as well as the Academy of Architecture in 1671 and various other institutions. He uh, began a process um, of centralization and this process of centralization is exactly the same process 
that Alexander Hamilton was later to adopt in the United States of America in the 18th century. Alexander Hamilton based his process of centralization on Colbert. Colbert would meet uh, with King Louis XIV almost daily where they would review policies and strategies. One of their um, policies was to centralize the tax system so that more wealth was returned immediately to the king rather th than to outlying districts and outlying um, uh, managers and rulers. This process made um, King Louis extraordinarily wealthy enough to build uh, magnificent palaces which rivaled his counterparts and his rivals in Europe and helped to make him one of the um, most important monarchs in Europe. Now in the uh, 17th century France had territories in the Caribbean and territories uh, in what is now the United States of America. What is now the United States of America was in fact a series of separate countries or states as it were ruled by colonial powers. Spain had a bit, England had a bit, France had a bit. The French bit was known colloquially as Louisiana but it was a vast territory much bigger than the present state of Louisiana. In the Caribbean they controlled islands such as Haiti or Hispaniola. Now this was the whole island of which Haiti is but a part which includes the present day San Domingo or, or Santo Domingo and this island was often referred to colloquially as Hispaniola. They also controlled other islands Saint, such as Saint Lucia and territories such as Guadeloupe and territories in South America and some in Central America. But at the beginning of the 17th century uh, these territories were being run on a sort of haphazard basis. The status of the people that worked on those um, worked in those colonies was uncertain. Native Americans made up a considerably large number of the people that worked and lived in these areas. As that population began to decline, colonial powers including England, Spain and France began to transport people of African descent uh, into the uh, so-called Caribbean islands, uh, Central America and South America. The French process of exploitation was behind that of Spain and Portugal. Spain and Portugal led the way in these activities. England was also behind Spain and Portugal and was slow to develop a policy. Spain and Portugal ran a system of racial inequality based on the purity of blood, sangria azul. This um, system of uh, racial uh, or ethnic inequality um, was backed up by religion and the economic determinism so that uh, people of African descent were forced into the servile class through a series of enactments, religious enactments, political enactments and economic orders to try and create a unified uh, enslaved labour. The Spanish were less successful at doing that than the Portuguese the Portuguese in Brazil were far more inverted commas successful at exploiting um, the people of African descent than, um, the, uh, than, the, than the Spanish were. The French studying the principles of uh, Sangria Azul and adopting some of the ideas from the English Barbados Code. Barbados Code was a early code in the 1660s that um, attempted to um, make slavery legal in Barbados and 
adopting some of the regulations that were coming out of states like Virginia in the 1660s, 1670s, they created um, under Colbert a system called Code Noir. Now, Colbert was instrumental in the creation of Code Noir, absolutely instrumental. Now, he initially drafted the preliminary reports and created um, a, a sort of project based on 52 articles with instruction and the through committee uh, he got individuals to examine and discuss what the status of people of African descent were in French colonies in, in Central America, the, the Caribbean um, and South America and um, as I said Louisiana. The result was um, uh, that on the uh, the 30th of April um, 1681 um, uh, Colbert began to investigate um, the status of Africans in the Antilles and, uh, and to find out whether they were s inverted commas slaves, slaves for life or indentured labour, how exactly their, um, their status worked and the economic effect of that. Colbert was concerned to make sure that the French colonies worked economically, that they were an economic entity that benefited France. In order to do this, Africans had to be reduced into perpetual enslavement that process took time Colbert was fundamentally instrumental in the creation of that process but we need to explore how that came to be the first thing is that the Code Noir uh, sought to distinguish Native Americans from Africans previously Native Americans had been enslaved by French colonial authorities the Code Noir effectively pushed aside the enslavement of Native America. There was still some of it going on, um, but pushed it aside so that the, from now on French colonial authorities would focus their enslaving processes on Africans. This was mostly because Native Americans were dwindling and dying as a result of colonial activities in the Caribbean and there was a general fear or concern that a Native American population would die out. That similar fear was not replicated when it came to people of African descent. The, um, uh, another key aspect of the Code Noir was to assert French sovereignty over colonial territories and to ensure that colonial um, uh, counterparts competitors such as England, Spain or Portugal did not supplant them. A key aspect of that was to make sure that French that the, that the uh, French authorities held an iron grip on the people of African descent, really subdued and controlled them and made sure that they um, were working entirely uh, uh, for France. So the enslavement of Africans became under the Code Noir a central aspect of uh, these measures. It was a measure to make enslavement work and to make the farming of cash crops like cotton etc functional. In order for cotton and other goods to be functional you need a large servile um, uh, workforce who um, uh, will work with little or no supervision for no pay um, and for long hours that's the only way um, that that kind of crop can be farmed without the relevant machinery and Colbert understood this and so the Code Noir was uh, a yes an extraordinarily um, uh, um, ethnically um, divisive uh, document but also it was an economic document a document that was about economics. So Colbert was concerned um, uh, that um, the uh, 
people of African descent did not begin to view themselves as French citizens with the rights of French citizens because therefore their capacity to be units of labor would be reduced. So he was keen therefore that there would be a unified system. He didn't quite succeed in creating that unified system but that was the intent. Now the measures that uh, were created under the Code Noir were initially rejected uh, by the French Parliament but then in 1687 uh, they were applied anyway uh, to colonial authorities in the Caribbean and then subsequently each state Guyana 1704 uh, the Reunion in 1723 and Louisiana in 1724 began to implement Code Noirs either um, the same uh, document that um, Colbert and later his son finished off or slightly amended documents slightly varying um, but with the same kind of principles and ideas. New France which also included parts of Canada in 1709 began to create their own ordinance effectively based on the Code Noir. Yes there was enslavement in areas such as Canada um, under French colonial authority in the 18th century based on the Code Noir this same Code Noir created by Colbert who is in the picture the painting the triumph of art that you can see or that we spoke about right at the beginning uh, this is an image of the later Code Noir um, and just go back to the first one again it says it was Leah Scalvers, Scalvers means slaves the slaves or negros, that's blacks, Africans of the Medikeek, they are a colloquial term to refer to the Western Hemisphere, telling us that this is about the, the slaves, the African slaves, the a enslaved African people of the Americas, and that this is a document created for the French to know how to manage those people. Uh, this uh, later Le Code Noir is from 1724 uh, um, uh, etc. onwards and clearly identifies itself as a regimen as a series of laws created in Paris for, to continue the process. The preamble, the ideas uh, in this are sort of coded here in this rather euphemistic phrase where uh, we see Colbert talking about having good knowledge of how this colony would benefit if it were possible for the inhabitants to purchase slaves known as Panis uh, whose nation is distant from this country we for the great pleasure of his majesty ordain that all Panis and Negroes who have been purchased or who will be purchased at some time will belong to those who have purchased them so key aspects of these documents included uh, very harsh punishments uh, against enslaved people and a ethnic system of regulation. One of the key features of the uh, Code Noir was that uh, Jewish people uh, could not reside in French colonial territory. So these documents are anti-Semitic documents as well as being tinged, framed with ethnic um, uh, chauvinism. The reason why the French government was afraid of Jewish people is that there was an idea that uh, Jewish people were connected to uh, a power that power being the power of the Netherlands the Netherlands had a relatively tolerant society that encouraged the migration of Protestants and uh, dissenters including Jewish people uh, when the Netherlands gained its independence from the powers of, of Spain um, and also from the authority of uh, Holy Roman Empire therefore uh, Jewish merchants and traders were active in Holland in promoting to a certain extent Dutch nationalism so the attempt at restricting Jewish migration uh, to colonial territories was coded under the term of preventing 
um, the Netherlands from gaining territories in French um, uh, colonies but of course there was a strong sense of anti-semitism there too the another key tenant of the Code Noir was that people of African descent uh, misnomered here as slaves must be baptized but their baptism didn't make them free and that they would be prohibited prohibited from uh, being members of any other religion including Protestantism or indeed animism or any other system of religious systems yeah? and only those um, including Europeans as well only those people who had been baptized could be married so we'll come later on to the question of what the Code Noir actually said about marriages between people of African descent by making people of African descent property um, and this is an important thing this process of making people into property was a staged process it didn't just happen just like that it was a process that made um, these people enslaved a process um, that made uh, these people perpetually enslaved. This process was strongly, strongly encouraged through the enactment of the Code Noir uh, by uh, Jean Baptiste um, Colbert. So, another key tenant of the Code Noir was that children born to a woman of African descent and a free man that um, if the father um, uh, was a, a free man there was the potentiality of that child being free so to prevent that enactment there was a general proviso that the child would be in would take on the status of the mother and uh, the this was to make sure that the free people because there were free people of color there were free people of African descent who had bought their freedom or who had come to the colonial territories by other means or had acquired their freedom um, through working for it and purchasing it it was to prevent this population from becoming very very large and to do that when they had uh, the French authorities through the Code Noir felt that they had to control the proliferation of these types of marriages. If a um, a, a child born a, is born to a an enslaved person and a free man, the fa and the father was otherwise unmarried, then according to this law, he is supposed to marry the slave concubine and free her and her children. So there was the potential for a free man to lift up the status of the African woman that he was with so it actually was for the benefit of African women to look upwards in terms of status and to seek out men um, of whatever ethnicity, ethnicity, ethnicity and to improve their status by marrying those men um, uh, or getting married by those men second way that if there was a, a child born to an enslaved person a free man uh, if, if the uh, marriage was bigamous or if the relationship was extramarital there was a punishment that would be inflicted on the slave master um, uh, or on the free man um, for this activity yes um, and the children would not be free now in most cases free men especially if European men who had relationships with African women enslaved African women had absolutely no intention whatsoever in marrying them and freeing their children so all they had to do was pay a fine but in reality no fines very few fines were paid and so what this Code Noir does is effectively say yes you can have children uh, with these women but these children are not automatically 
free. Furthermore, the, the Act also says that weddings between enslaved people are strictly under the master's permission. Of course, you need uh, the, the enslaved person's consent as well, for that, uh, but the important point is that the master controls uh, whether the marriage takes place. Children born between married slaves are also slaves automatically. There had been some question mark over whether those children born to enslaved people were in fact slaves. The law says unequivocally that children born to enslaved people, even though uh, both parents are married, um, those children are automatically enslaved. Children um, b uh, born between a enslaved man um, and a free woman uh, can be free under the auspices that we've just been talking about. Other provisions. Enslaved peoples must not carry weapons except under the permission of their masters and for hunting purposes. This was to prevent the proliferation of uh, armed Africans uh, walking abroad. In other words, the right to carry arms was a European male right and it was not a right extended to men of African descent and certainly not to women of African descent. Enslaved people uh, belonging to different masters must not gather together. So this was to prevent uh, uh, those enslaved people from different plantations meeting to talk about their circumstance and situation and therefore being able to compare their circumstance and situation. So Africans were kept separate from each other based on their plantations and who owned them and masters were encouraged and by this law uh, uh, more than encouraged to keep their enslaved people separate from other enslaved peoples. Uh, um, enslaved Africans could not sell sugarcane even with the permission of their masters that they could also not sell other commodities without their master's permission. Uh, the, the, their masters must give them food and clothing um, uh, and, and enslaved people could testify but only in relation to information and not against their master. An enslaved person who struck his or her master, wife, mistress or children would be immediately executed. It's very important. Other provisions of the Code Noir is that uh, a fugitive or enslaved person absent for a month who had been absent for a month from their plantation would have their ears cut off and be branded as a sign, as a symbol. Um, and then uh, they would have, if they were absent for a further month or if they absconded again, they would have their hamstring. Hamstring is the, the tendons that run along the back of the leg, enabling you to walk or run. Uh, they would be cut and you'd be branded again. And if you tried to abscond a third time from your master, uh, you would be killed. Free, uh, free Africans, Africans that were not enslaved, who harbored and worked with fugitive slaves, would be beaten uh, by their slave master could be beaten by a slave could be beaten sorry my mistake could be beaten by a slave owner though they are supposed to be free and they would be fined 300 pounds of sugar per day um, for every day that the enslaved person is harbored by them so what this is actually saying is that even though there are free people and the act recognizes that the act is also saying that an African can be beaten for harboring an enslaved person, which is sort of suggesting that the freedom of all Africans in colonial territories is in jeopardy. Other um, provisions of the Act include that, um, uh, that um, uh, regarding the status of uh, enslaved Africans. Instead, enslaved Africans are not French citizens but freed uh, uh, people are French um, subjects even if born elsewhere and have the same rights as colonial subjects but then we've just seen the punishment that can be meted out to people 
of African descent who are free so there's a, a, a sort of dichotomy there, a conflict in the way in which the law is written. So these measures were extraordinarily harsh and they're harsh on paper um, but in effect they are much much worse and they gave license to European French colonial authorities to enact severe draconian um, uh, and terrible punishments on people of African descent both those that were free and those that were enslaved and it also gave them license to commit acts of, um, uh, uh, of brutality against um, African women and the children uh, from those union uh, even if the uh, person who was their father was an aristocrat had no automatic right to gain authority or position so these were called morganatic unions that's the term and it meant that the morganatic union meant that the child the child the child of dual heritage did not inherit position power and authority from the father but had the status of the mother so this created an enormous set of anomalies um, Colbert's measurement uh, created those anomalies yeah. because there was a huge proliferation in children of dual heritage these are the people born of white aristocratic French fathers and uh, mothers of African descent uh, enslaved and free these people uh, such as Vincent Ogie whose image that I hope that you can see some of these individuals could pass for white in France if brought to France but in Haiti or Guadeloupe or, or other French colonial territories they would be regarded with the rather derogatory term of mulatto so these individuals often had a conflicting perspective on their own ethnicity often they would be raised by their fathers either in Haiti or in France to be gentlemen to speak as a polyglot several languages uh, to be able to fence and sword fight uh, to be pugilists to read Latin and Greek uh, English and French um, various uh, Italian languages to study the classics and to see themselves as divine beings but if they were to return back to Haiti uh, or back um, uh, to Guadeloupe they would be regarded merely as a mulatto with not many rights this conflict created a separate class of people throughout the French colonial territories uh, th this separate class of people were those of dual heritage such as Vincent Ogie whose image that you can see here but also free men and women of color that's of where both parents were of African descent uh, who had brought themselves into freedom uh, and and had position and status as a result of acquiring independent wealth these individuals often read and studied uh, in France as well um, obtaining the status uh, colloquial status of French citizens in France but then on returning back to the countries that they were to the territories that they were born in in Guadeloupe or Haiti they were often treated as enslaved people so these classes of free people became disenchanted angry and embittered with France the result uh, was that uh, there was disenchantment and revolution uh, this revolution uh, in particularly the one of the most famous of all uh, was the Haitian Revolution uh, a, a term in fact that actually describes a revolution that took place not just in what is now Haiti but also throughout the whole island of Hispaniola 
this was a war of attrition a war of attrition in which um, individuals like Francis Mackendall, uh, Vincent Ogi um, and Bookman Dutty um, played a striking and important role. Charles Leclerc in the 18th century uh, who was Bonaparte's uh, brother-in-law was dispatched to Haiti and his wife Pauline Bonaparte, the sister of, of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte seen here in this image were dispatched um, to Haiti to manage uh, this colonial territory and to manage really the fallout of the after effects the unforeseen after effects of enslavement and the code noir the same code um, that Colbert had introduced the brutality and the savagery that occurred as a result of this conflict where Europeans committed the most atrocious acts um, under the authority of the Code Noir and under the authority of the French powers was was terrible. Uh, Pauline Bonaparte saw herself as a monarch. She described herself, here I reign like Josephine, I hold first place. She's talking about her control over Haiti. Um, and many of the measures that were implemented were truly um, uh, uh, devastating. For example, the clerk taught um, uh, dogs how to kill and eat live African people, uh, effectively teaching dogs how to become racialized. Um, he introduced new punishments involving torture and mutilation the result was a conflict and war of attrition a war of attrition in which um, uh, individuals such as Bookman Dutty uh, told the people of African descent to throw away the image of God of the whites who thirst for our tears and listen to the voice of liberty which speaks in the hearts of all of us and Cecile Fatiman uh, a Hugon priestess also of dual heritage of a, of a white French father and these individuals encouraged uh, the people of African descent in Haiti to rise up against the Code Noir to rise up against the measures that Colbert had created to rise up against French colonial authorities and to make Haiti an independent state the result was a protracted conflict of bloodshed uh, where individuals such as Toussaint Lee Overture emerged uh, with victory as the commander not only of um, uh, Haiti but of the whole island until he was tricked schemingly tricked um, brought to France and effectively killed uh, poisoned his successor uh, was John Jack Dessalines who became first emperor of Haiti and um, later on um, uh, Henry Christophe here with his coin 1820 his coin uh, became followed on the footsteps now these people Toussaint Bookman Dutty Cecile Fatiman Toussaint Lee Overture Dessalines Henry Christophe they are not what Colbert had in mind when he created the Code Noir when the Code Noir was created it was not intended that Henry Christophe would start minting coins with his face on it or that Dessalines would become Emperor and not only declare himself Emperor but then say that he was going to free make statements about freeing um, people of African descent throughout the Western Hemisphere. It was not intended that Haiti would be the shining star of a new African Republic and give rise to rebellions in North, Central and South America and perhaps inspire European uh, revolutions elsewhere as well including perhaps um, the revolutions of Simon Bolivar uh, throughout South America 
That was not the intention of the Code Noir, but that was a reaction against the harsh measures and the draconian measures that the Code Noir created. Meanwhile, in France, the Code Noir created a very strange um, uh, set of affairs. In France, those people of African descent, either of dual heritage or um, those who were not, had a strange status. Many of these individuals could rise up into prominent positions within French society. Notable individuals became major generals, architects, painters, artists, luminaries, uh, sophisticated um, uh, writers uh, within 18th century French society, despite the, uh, uh, the um, statements and despite uh, the enactment of the Code Noir. One of them was Chevalier de Saint George, Joseph Bologna, seen here in a cartoon taking on uh, in a duel um, Colonel G. Hanger. Now, um, this uh, duel shows uh, uh, Chevalier de Saint George as a pugilist, but Chevalier de Saint George was much more than that. He was a senior army commander, a notable French aristocrat, perhaps one of the most adept pugilists and sword fighters um, uh, in, in, in France, and also a poet, a wit, a musical composer. Many of his uh, musical um, um, notations, uh, operas, concertos, etc., are available uh, on YouTube. You can look them up um, after this lecture. I, I hope that you do. And you can see that this man was prolific. He was well known and well loved in the early period of his career. Uh, and cartoons like this depicted him as a sort of champion of sort of French society and he was championed in many ways and respected even by the lower members of society, the lower class members of society despite being an affluent and aristocratic member but let's remember as I've just said that this was a man of dual heritage interestingly in this cartoon uh, he's shown having a duel uh, with um, uh, Colonel G. Uh, Hanger and on the left of the cartoon is Madame Dion. But Madame Dion isn't, <coughs> isn't quite, or when we see the image of Madame Dion we need to carefully contextualize it because in fact um, uh, Madame Dion was also known as Chevalier Dion, someone who, who we now believe was a transvestite and perhaps even intersex. So there is an interesting dichotomy here in that two of the most famous equestrians uh, known for their chivalric arts in 18th century France was a man of dual heritage and a person of uh, intersex um, and transsexual, um, transvestite uh, uh, gender who actually blurred the lines of gender. So this is a very interesting reflection of 18th century French society. Thomas Dumas was another one of those individuals who suffered as a result of the Code Noir. Thomas Dumas was born in Haiti under this code um, and his mother had been enslaved. Therefore, by default, he would have taken on that status if the code had been followed. But his father brought him to France. He quickly rose up the ranks and became the equivalent of a major general. He is seen here in, on the image on the right in a cartoon uh, displaying extraordinary military capacity. He became one of the chief um, military proponents in 18th century France and a rival to Napoleon. His son was Alexander Dumas. Alexander Dumas was of course the writer 
of the Three Musketeers, the man in the Iron Mask, etc. Alexander Dumas knew full well his African heritage and it is interesting in fact that the name Dumas is the mother's name, the African Caribbean mother's name, not the father's name that was uh, Davy Palantiri. So uh, it is interesting that they bear their African Caribbean mother's name and all of the descendants that call themselves Dumas bear the African Caribbean mother's name. So Dumas was well um, voiced in the fact of the implications of the Code Noir and that he as far as he was concerned Colbert was a villain. Uh, Colbert appears not only uh, directly in The Man in the Iron Mask or ten years later in the uh, French uh, novel novels that um, come after The Three Musketeers but he is probably uh, a reflection of the scheming French courtiers that are also in The Three Musketeers but directly in Man in the Iron Mask and ten years later Colbert is directly referenced as a schemer, a trickster, a manipulator and this is directly I believe reflective of the ethnic laws uh, that he um, created and which Dumas's family suffered under. So um, th this is a uh, um, uh, we've sort of gone through quite a lot of things um, to sort of decontextualize and decolonize this painting. Um, Jean-Baptiste Colbert is a remarkably important individual in 17th century French society. A remarkably divisive character because he helped to create the ethnic chauvinism which later gave rise to the racialized systems of black codes and black laws which followed and the Code Noir in the United States of America and other British colonies. They patterned their black codes, their, their slave codes, Jim Crow law on the measures that uh, Colbert created. And therefore it is absolutely right that we contextualize Colbert. It is also absolutely right that we um, contextualize Colbert with men and women of African descent like Cecile Fatiman and others that fought against the Code Noir. So if we are sort of giving honour uh, and respect, or uh, perhaps we shouldn't give respect, but if we are remembering um, Colbert then we also ought to remember Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Uh, we also ought to remember Cecile Fatiman. We also ought to remember Bookman Dutty and Henry Christoph, uh, Thomas Dumas and Alexander Dumas because they had to live under the measures that Colbert created. And I think that it's important that we decontextualize and deconstruct many of the, um, uh, these Renaissance paintings and simply don't just take them at face value. Um, this is an immensely divisive figure uh, who uh, implemented measures that helped to give birth to the science of race and I think that it's important that his life is contextualized in the appropriate way and um, I hope that all of you who um, have listened uh, to this lecture do your own research on the measures of the Code Noir that Colbert created and begin that process of decontextualizing. Thank you.